Good morning. Welcome to Grace Community Church online. Uh, due to the weather, we have closed the services today uh, for the building. And uh, I think this message that I'm going to give, I don't think uh, the enemy wanted me to preach it. So he thought he could throw snow down, but he didn't realize that Travis and DJ were tough, strong like bull. They'd drive through this, and they didn't realize either that I come from Connecticut. We get this much snow in July. So anyhow, I thank you guys all for tuning in. I pray that you would uh, tune in completely on this message because I feel as if, again, God has laid it heavy on my heart. And, um, but before we start, <clears throat> I'd like to ask you to go grab, if you could, a piece of paper and something to write on. I have these little index cards we are going to give. Uh, if anybody doesn't have them at home here, I can give you some right here. Grab it from me. But anyhow, you can uh, grab those. I'm going to give you a couple seconds to do that. And again, something to write with. And if there's more than one of you there, grab a piece of paper and something to write for each one of you. And I uh, would appreciate that because we're going to use that a little bit later on. Thank you. <clears throat> While you're getting that, I want to first remind you that um, the message that God's laid on my heart today may seem a little hard for some. Some may even get a little offended, and I, I apologize for that up front, but I know that Jesus uh, was never concerned about that. He was more concerned about getting the truth out. And so uh, that's what I plan on doing this morning, is getting the truth out. But I also want to remind you that we are saved by grace. And so even these things I talk about, grace is the overlying thing that covers us all when we receive Jesus as our Savior. And, um, but there's still things in the Bible that he talks about that... Um, that are consequences if we don't obey, even though we may be saved. Sometimes uh, people will tell you, very often people tell you, you don't talk about politics in church. They don't mix. And um, I don't find that in my Bible. I find actually that, uh, that politics is all through the Bible. Even the first five books of, the, of Moses are called the law. And uh, through those were the Jewish leaders who were also the spiritual leaders, but they were also the political leaders. They're the ones who made the law, and, and the law was supposed to be based on God's law, uh, but they were also the ones that enforced the law. And when you look at politics, that's really all it is. When we think of our government, the three branches of government, we think of the fact that there is a judicial branch, an executive branch, and there's a congressional branch, and each one of those branches has something to do with the law. The congressional branch will actually uh, write the laws. The executive branch will either sign it into law or deny it. Um, and the judicial branch will be the one to interpret whether or not it's a legal law um, based on the Constitution. So um, I believe that uh, we see the same thing with the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish leaders back then, and, uh, and they did the same thing. They enforced the law. They wrote and added to the law based on God's law. And so we're going to touch on that a little bit um, because of what's been going on in this country. Normally, I, I wait until I'm asked to preach, and uh, um, you know, I might be 20th down the list, you know, kind of like the third or fourth page on a Google search, which is fine. But at the same time, this is the only time I've ever asked to preach. I felt like God was laying it on my heart, and I felt like God was saying, I want you to do it now because of everything going on in our country. We're seeing censorship like we've never seen before, in my days anyhow, and uh, we're seeing a cancel culture right now that is trying to wipe out history and change it and rewrite it. And, uh, but we need to remember what the history was of this country and where it came from and why God, I believe, why God blessed it in the past. 
I mean, we're even seeing things like the censorship of a guy who makes pillows. And, and uh, I saw recently that there are a bunch of stores that have banned his pillows. And I sit there and they were saying, and they Twitter took them off too. And they say, well, why? Why is a pillow guy, my pillow or Mr. Pillow, Mike Lindell, his name is, why are they pulling his stuff off? Why is he a threat to, tw- to Twitter? And then it occurred to me, if there's a th- third world war, and if it's not done with guns and bombs, or it's not a chemical warfare, or a cyber warfare, maybe it'll be a really large pillow fight. And I only have three or four pillows at my house. This guy's got a factory full of them, and especially now that they can't sell them, he's got even more in back stock. So if there's a World War III pillow fight, we're in trouble. But anyhow, all kidding aside, I, I, I had to look, and what's the problem with them? Well, one of them is, is that he supported a president, and we can use the name because if I say a past president, you know it is, Trump. He supported President Trump, and they don't like President Trump. They hate him. They hate him with a passion that I've never felt so much hate, and, and again, in all my years. It's, it's a thick hate. It's like, to me, it feels like going out on a, on a uh, in July in Florida, and you have that just debilitating heat and that humidity that you feel like you can cut through it with a knife. And I feel like the hate for for this man is like I've never seen before. But there's another reason why they pulled Mr. Pillow off. Right when I heard that the stores were banning him, places like Kroger and Kohl's and Bed Bath & Beyond, and I heard recently Target too, um, Personally, me, I won't support stores like that when they're going to censor. But I told my wife, I said, hey, Sue, let's just go out and get a couple of those pillows. Went out and bought them, opened up the pillow. There's another reason why they pulled him off from Twitter and out of the stores. When we pulled the pillows out of the box, inside the box there was a little piece of paper, and it was a Bible scripture. And if you notice when you see him on his ads, he's got a big cross that he wears all the time on a necklace. And he's very outspoken about his faith and about his past, where he's been. I guess uh, he had uh, some real addictions to drugs and stuff before that. So this is what's happening in our country that I've never seen happen so much before as now. And it's time that we as Christians... And this message is going to be geared mostly to those of you who claim to follow Jesus, to claim to know him, claim to put, have put your trust in him. Because I believe it's up to us to get spiritually built up. We need to body build our spiritual lives. And that's hopefully what I'm going to be able to help you with today and help myself with today. But before we do that, let's open up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this time. I pray, Lord, that, that, that I would be moved aside and that you would speak through me. I pray, Lord, that uh, any truth that you want spoken, I'll speak, and I'll do it without fear and without worry of consequence. But, Lord, that none of the words that I speak will be my own. I pray they're yours. Lord, we love you, and we give you the praise, and we lift this up in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, I just want to reiterate, you know, that our salvation is by grace. And especially for those of you that are listening, that that maybe uh, you're new to Christianity or to church, um, this sermon may seem a little more harsh. uh, But really, one of the reasons I love serving in this church is because it is so grace-filled. Its name just fits it so well. And all the leaders here at the church open their arms to anybody who's going through anything in their lives, whether it be, um, you know, infidelity or abortions or drug or alcohol abuse or whatever it may be. um, This church is here for you and the the leaders are here for you. And it's uh, one of the things I love about it. But. One of the things that you'll see going back to this cancel culture is that the media 
very often in schools and, and, and different government leaders will try to tell you that this country is, is not been founded or has not been founded on Judeo-Christian principles. But, um, and then if they, if they do recognize any of that, they make every single one of those leaders out to be some nasty person, some, some bad person, evil, doing all sorts of bad things. And um, our, our, our history doesn't really show that to be true. So in order for us to understand where we've been, why we were blessed as a nation, and where we're going, and why we've got to be spiritually strong, I think it's important for us to see some of the history so that you can see really why this country was, uh, you know, in my opinion, made into a great country by the Lord. Uh, let me start with the whole thing of separation of church and state. And uh, we hear that all the time. The, the Supreme Court rules on it. And, and if you ask most people on the street, where does separation of church and state come from? They'll tell you from the Constitution. And it does not come from the Constitution. It comes from a letter written by Thomas Jefferson, who was the author. He was a third president. He was also the author of the Declaration of Independence. And he was writing a letter to the Danbury Baptists uh, in, in Connecticut, not far from where I came from. And uh, I'm not going to read you the whole letter, but I want to read to you what it says. But before I do, I want to also remind you that uh, whenever we read something from anybody, no matter what it is, if we're not there with the author, we have to try to interpret what the author's intended meaning is. We do that with the Bible. We try to interpret what was it that God was laying on the hearts of the writers in the Bible and what did they mean? What was going on during that time? What would have caused them to say what they said? And, and, and what was their meaning? It shouldn't be about us. It needs to be about them. So what we need to know is on this letter, when it was written in the founding fathers and the forefathers that we had, they came from a place, they came over from England where religion was run by the government. The government was telling them how to worship, where to worship, everything about worship. And literally people could be actually, um, uh, you know, killed for, for believing something that wasn't part of what the government told them to believe. So when they come over here, they didn't want the government to be part of religion. They wanted a freedom on that. So we need to know that. Because as we read these things, we need to know where they're coming from so that we can interpret what they wrote properly. One of the, uh, one of the things in the letter says, Believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, that he owes account to none other for his faith or worship, that the legitimate powers of government reach actions only and not opinions. I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people which declared that their legislature should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus, build, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. So this is where it actually came from, the church, separation of church and state. But as you can see from this, he's telling the government they have no right to get involved in religion. It never says anything about the fact that uh, religion um, can't be in the government. So when you see some of the Supreme Court uh, decisions that come out, you will see that they will say that they believe, though, that the First Amendment implies that uh, there's a separation of church and state. So I just want you to see uh, hear this too. The First Amendment, real quickly, was, was written 11 years before um, uh, that letter to the, the Baptist, uh, the Danbury Baptist. And, and if you look at the, the First Amendment, it does not imply, in my opinion at all, that there's a separation of church and state, but only that government should be out of the, out of the religion. And let me read to you the part that applies. It's just a short thing. It says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And that is basically what the First Amendment says, which is attached to the Constitution. So, 
So when, when we're told that uh, religion was not part of the government and that the government didn't, didn't want it to be, uh, they're misinterpreting it, and I can't help but believe they're misinterpreting it intentionally because they don't want religion anymore in this country. Um, let me read to you what some of the founding, fa I mean, uh, yeah, some of the uh, buildings that the, our forefathers built. Uh, I'm just going to read a couple quick things just so you'll know. But if, if it's supposed to be separation of church and state, these politicians have never been in their own town of Washington, D.C., because all the buildings there, with very few exceptions, are just got stuff written about Bible quotes and, and, and quotes about God all through them. A couple quick ones just to, to give you a little taste of it. Um, top of the Washington Monument has a big aluminum capstone that reads Las Deo, which means praise be to God. There's a cornerstone in the Washington Monument where they actually have a Holy Bible, a Declaration of Independence, and a U.S. Constitution all together. Why do they have them together? Because this was a nation under God. The Bible is above the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution, and they intended it that way. There's also, all up the thing, there's landings that have quotes from God and quotes, uh, pictures, all sorts of different things that tie into God and the Bible. There's blocks on the monument that say things like holiness to the Lord, search the scriptures, uh, in God we trust, and in, in uh, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old he will not depart from you. It doesn't sound a lot like they want to separate, <clears throat> get religion out of government, just the other way around. The capital the Capitol building has stuff all over it, too. There's, uh, in the rotunda, there's eight pictures. Four of those pictures have religious paintings, huge ones. One of them with a monk kneeling on the ground with somebody uh, uh, pounding in a crucifix behind him. Um, they have, in God we trust, all through it. There's a glass window depicting George Washington in prayer under the inscription, in God we trust. The Lincoln Memorial... On the one side has the Gettysburg Address, only 267 words long, and he said, we are highly received, uh, uh, resolved rather, that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom. And then on the a second inaugural address in the Lincoln Memorial on the other side, it's only got 703 words, but he mentions God 14 times, and he quotes the Bible twice. <clears throat> Jefferson Memorial, again, he was the third president. Uh, Jefferson Memorial, they have a bunch of panels in there with different things written on, on his memorial. One of them says, on the second panel is an excerpt from a bill for establishing religious freedom, 1777. It was passed by the Virginia Assembly in 1786. It reads, Almighty God hath created the mind free. All attempts to influence, to influence it by temporal punishments or burdens, are a departure from the plan of the holy author of our religion. No man shall be compelled to frequent or support any religious worship or ministry, or shall otherwise suffer on account of his religious opinions or belief, but all men shall be free to profess and by argument to maintain their opinions in matters of religion. I know but one code of morality for men, whether acting singly or collectively. The third panel in there is, uh, it, it gives the 1785 notes on the state of Virginia. It reads, God who gave us life gave us liberty. But this is one right here that makes me really kind of almost shudder. And uh, it's almost like he knew what was coming. And a lot of these leaders did at the time. They knew what would happen from the greed of man if we weren't kept in check. He says, indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever. The last one is the Supreme Court. And ironically, the Supreme Court is the same court that is making decisions about prayer out of school, and they came up and ruled that the Ten Commandments in, in, in classrooms and in schools is unconstitutional. 
They did this years ago. They even came up with something saying uh, with the state of Kentucky when they took it to court that it's unconstitutional for it to be in their courts in Kentucky. The amazing thing is, though, the Ten Commandments is all through the, the uh, Supreme Court. Um, if you look at it, um, they have, uh, in, the, there's a, in the building, there's several images of Moses with the Ten Commandments. These can be found at the center of the sculpture over the east portico of the Supreme Court building, inside the actual courtroom. And finally, engraved over the chair of the Chief Justice is the Ten Commandments, and also engraved on bronze doors on the Supreme Court itself is the Ten Commandments. Um, seems a little ironic that um, these people say that there's a separation of church and state. One last thing I want to read before we get into some scriptures is what some of the past presidents said. We're going to just do a few of the early ones. We'll start with a couple of quotes from George Washington. One of the things he said is, it is impossible to rightly govern a nation without God and the Bible. He also said the propitious smiles of heaven uh, can never be expected on a nation that disregards the internal rules of order and right, which heaven itself has ordained. The second president, John Adams, wrote, we recognize no sovereign but God and no king but Jesus. The fourth president, James Madison, we have staked the whole future of American civilization, not on the power of government, far from it. We have staked the whole of our political institutions upon the capacity of mankind for self-government, upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves according to the commandments of God. The future and success of America is not in this constitution, but in the laws of God upon which this constitution is founded. The fifth president, James Monroe, before any man can be considered as a member of civil society, he must be considered a subject of the governor of the universe. And to the same divine author of every good and perfect gift, we are indebted for all those privileges and advantages, religious as well as civil, which are so richly enjoyed in this favored land. The last one I want to read to is from Andrew Jackson. He was the seventh president. He said, and by the way, this is just a small uh, sampling of the many, many different quotes in these buildings and from these, these past leaders. Andrew Jackson says, finally, it is my fervent prayer to that almighty being before whom I now stand and who has kept us in his hands from the infancy of our republic until the present day, the present day, that he will so overrule all my intentions and actions and inspire the hearts of my fellow citizens that we may be preserved from dangers of all kinds and continue forever a united and happy people. I have a tough time looking at separation of church and state when I see these things that are written. And I will say this, I don't believe God wants us to separate church and state. I want to read one quick one from Reagan. I actually have this quote in my office. I love it. And Reagan was quoted as saying, if we ever forget that we are one nation under God, then we will be a nation gone under. And uh, I don't think that we could uh, speak any more true words than that. I believe that this is why the United States was so blessed from the beginning. I believe it's because our leaders, they actually came here with God as their head. And I want to read to you what the Bible actually says about that. So we can see that God will bless those, those countries that follow him and watch him. So, first of all, I want to go to Deuteronomy 28. Now, for those of you who are not uh, very familiar with the Bible, Deuteronomy was one of the books of the law that Moses wrote. Um, and it was written, Deuteronomy really means second law. And it was written because 
uh, all the people, when they gave the first law, if you will, in the book of Exodus and then scattered out in some of the other uh, books that he wrote, but they had to wander in the desert for 40 years and all the, the, the men from 20 years old uh, uh, and, and over had died in that 40-year period. And, um, and again, it was because they hadn't uh, uh, trusted God in that. So he, Moses, they were just about to enter the promised land and all these new men had never heard the law before. So he basically reiterated it. And that's where Deuteronomy comes from. But let me read to you starting from, uh, it's going to be chapter 28. Uh, and we're going to read a couple verses and then skip down, read a couple more. So that verse one says, if you fully, now there's a big word here, if. You're going to see that a lot in the Bible. As a matter of fact, we, we hear a lot that money is preached in the Bible and taught in the Bible more than any other subject. And love is number two. Um, but I would love to see how many places in the Bible, it says, if then, if we do something, then this will happen. If we don't do something, then this will happen. And, and whether it be good or bad, and there's a ton of them through the Bible, but I'm just picking a few that I think are very pertinent to today. And so again, starting at verse one, it says, if you fully obey the Lord and uh, your God and carefully follow his commands, I give you today, the Lord God will set you high above all the nations on earth. All these blessings will come upon you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. If we skip down to verse 12 of chapter 28, and the, and by the way, in between there, he says a whole bunch of different blessings that he'll give the nation if they do that. And then in verse 12, he says, the Lord will open the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty, to send rain on your land in season and to bless all the work of your hands. You will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. That shows financial strength. The Lord will make you the head, not the tail. If you pay attention to the commands of the Lord your God that I give you this day and carefully follow them, you will always be at the top, never at the bottom. Do not turn aside from any of the commands I give you today, to the right or to the left, following other gods and serving them. So I'm going to take you also to a scripture that shows a king. We had, a, we had some kings after David. You had Solomon. After Solomon, the nation of Israel split. And in the nation of Israel, um, the, the, the ten, 10 of the tribes went to the north, and they called that Israel. Two of the tribes went to the bottom. They called it Judah. It, when Israel, not one king followed God. They all were opposed to him. Uh, but in Judah, there were several kings. I say several. There's probably about seven or eight, eight kings, I think, that actually followed God. Some of them followed him more wholeheartedly than others. Some didn't give completely to God, but they, but they still trusted in God and wanted to obey some of his commands. One of the kings that was a good king that was blessed and protected was King Hezekiah. He was one of the last uh, getting toward the end of the life of Judah. And at the same time that he was king, Israel, the northern part, was actually taken over by an Assyrian king. And Assyria was the world power back then. So I'm going to start in chapter 18. I'm going to read verses uh, 1 through 8. It says, In the third year of Hosea, uh, son of Elah, king of Israel, which was again the northern tribe, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, uh, became king of Judah. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. He removed the high places. Let me just reiterate here. Some of the kings that followed God when they said they did what was right in the eyes of God, a lot of them, though, didn't remove the high places and didn't do what Hezekiah was doing here, these things that he did. He removed the high places. He smashed the sacred stones and cut down the Asherah poles. He broke into pieces the bronze snake that Moses had made, for up to that time, the Israelites had been burning incense to it. So it's, it, it was called Neshustan, Nehushtan, something, somebody stands. 
Anyhow, Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was none like him among the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. He held fast to the Lord and did not cease to follow him. He kept the commands of the Lord that the Lord's uh, he kept the commands the Lord had given Moses and the Lord was with him and he was successful in whatever he undertook he rebelled against the king of Assyria king of Assyria was a, again a world power very very powerful took over all the countries around it and little Judah just a piece of Israel which is already small Assyria couldn't take over because God's hand was in it and he says, uh, the Lord was with him. He was successful in whatever he undertook. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. From watchtower to fortified city, he defeated the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory. Uh, I'm not going to read any further on it, but if you read into the story too, you'll see that Assyria actually came and surrounded Judah this massive army, and they mocked God. And, and Hezekiah prayed, and God, you'll see how God delivered the people of Judah. It's pretty incredible. Why? Because he followed the Lord, and he, he, gave his, he put his trust in, in God. But what happens if we don't do that? What happens if we walk away? And there's so many examples in the Bible of Israel going back and forth between following him and not following him and things going bad in their country versus things turning around in their country. And they're based on uh, whether or not the leader is following the Lord. So let's read a couple of scriptures. Let's go um, back to Deuteronomy. And we just read where in Deuteronomy, it said that we would be, a, when we're strong, we would be a, uh, a lender to nations, a borrower from none, and that we would be the head, not the tail, if we follow God. Let's see if we don't. Verse 15 starts, however, if, and here's that big word again, if you don't obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees I am giving you today, all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Then he goes through all the list of things that were on the previous page uh, uh, about the blessings, and he gives the opposite. And we're going we're gonna to go down uh, below that to uh, verse 43 and 44. And here he says, as he finishes going through the list of curses, he says, the alien who lives among you will rise above you higher and higher, but you will sink lower and lower. He will lend to you, but you will not lend to him. He will be the head, but you will be the tail. These are the things that happen when we don't follow the Lord. Let me give you an example now of a king. He was actually the final king uh, in Israel before Israel was taken over by Assyria. Um, and so I'm just using him as uh, the example because he's not the worst king in Israel, by the way, and they'll say that here, but he, he, was, he definitely did evil in God's sight. It says, uh, verse, uh, chapter 17, I'm sorry, of 2 Kings, verse 1, we're going to read through that, through 1 through 7. It says, in the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, Hosea, son of Elah, became king of Israel and Samaria. And he reigned nine years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, but not like the kings of Israel preceded him. Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up to attack Hosea, who had been Shalmaneser's vassal and had paid him tribute. But the king of Assyria discovered that Hosea was a traitor, for he had sent envoys to So, king of Egypt. And, so, and, and he no longer paid tribute to the king of Assyria as he had done year by year. Therefore, Shalmaneser seized him and put him in prison. The king of Assyria invaded the entire land, marched against Samaria, laid siege to it for three years. In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and deported the Israelites to Assyria. He settled them in Hala, in Gozan, and Habor River, and the towns of the Medes. So he scattered them all around. Verse 7 says, all this took place because the Israelites had sinned against the Lord their God. 
So we can see here there are consequences for not following Jesus and not following his commands. So where are we right now in America? Are we following God or are we not following God? I, I want to... I want to uh, just talk about some of the things that have happened in the past uh, 100 years or so. And we can look at history, even back to the 18, late 1800s, where we could see starting, some things starting to come into play that were showing that there were some leaders that were trying to break away from God and get our country to, to not follow God. Uh, but it seems as if the early 1900s is when it really seemed to uh, start taking hold. Some of the big events, real quickly, are 1933, FDR um, had people, had Americans bring in value, uh, bring in gold that was valued $100 or more and turn it into the Federal Reserve, um, and they would get a uh, money for it. But one of the things that a lot of people don't realize, the Federal Reserve is not part of the federal government. The Federal Reserve is a, a private bank run by private citizens, it's, it's regulated by the federal government, but it's actually not part of the federal government. And so what happened is the Federal Reserve was basically lending money, in a sense, to America. So we would turn in gold, they would hold the gold, and they'd print out money. Before that time, if you look at old dollar bills and stuff, it says silver certificate on the top of it. Silver certificate means that there's a piece of uh, silver or gold or some precious metal somewhere being stored that you own because that certificate is showing you that you own a dollar of it. There's the, actually a net worth to that piece of paper. <clears throat> After this took place, um, that, that went away. And now it says on the top of a dollar bill, Federal Reserve note, which just means it's a promise to pay. Uh, there's no value to it. If things fell apart, you couldn't go claim some gold in a in a in a uh, building somewhere. And what had ended up happening is our national debt went up 50 percent in three years from doing that, from 22 billion to 33 billion, which is nothing compared to what it is today. But it continues to climb like crazy today, uh, to the point where it's approximately $28 trillion our debt. So to put that in, some people think, oh, it's a number, whatever, just we can't really grasp it. Let's put it into context a little bit. That means that every person in this country owes $84,000 individually. To make it even a little more kind of hit home, I just put down a family of five. My wife and I had three kids. They're all on their own now. But a family of five owes $421,500. So you'd think with that kind of debt on a family of five, there's probably a pretty nice second home they have somewhere or something. But that's not the case. It's just a debt that's owed. Some of the things that have happened uh, since 1933 also that have continued moving our country away from God. Prayer was removed from school in 1962. Evolution is, was being taught as the only way, no longer really a theory from 1968 on. There were a lot of debates, even in the late 1800s, where people were trying to get uh, Darwinism in, but it was defeated. But 1968 was really when it became... Um, really illegal to teach creationism anymore. Um, 1973, abortion became illegal. Um, and we know, what is it, 35 or so million people in this country. 34% of the countries in, in the world now have legal abortion, and most of the countries on there are big. So population-wise, I'm sure it's well over 34%. And the list goes on and on and on. So what we see going on in our country right now is blatant lies, things that are trying to turn us away from God. And I'm not saying this to put fear in anybody. I'm saying this so that we as Christians can be ready. We need to be strong during this time. We need to be able to know what God's saying, what God's telling us, and we need to know how to be able to handle ourselves when we're going to be persecuted. We haven't seen that in this country, and it sure seems like it's heading that way. 
Some of the things that we're seeing, like there's no prayer in public schools, but they still do open up uh, Congress and certain things like that in prayer. So recently there was a prayer uh, for the opening of the 107th Congress, which just happened on January 4th this year. And a representative, Emanuel Cleaver of Missouri, he's the one who did the prayer. And then he ended the prayer by saying, amen and a woman. And we sit there and think he's trying to be gender specific. And he thought he was pretty clever. But I will tell you this, first of all, he doesn't really believe that there's such a thing as gender specific, so I'm not really sure why uh, he has to say amen and a woman. Maybe he should just say a when he finishes his prayer. I don't really know. But I want to read you Galatians 6, 7. It says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. And I will tell you that this politician, Emmanuel Cleaver, He just sowed something I don't think he really wanted to sow, and I don't think he's aware of what he really sowed. The other thing about evolution being taught in the schools now and being the only way is, again, if we believe that that, that the Bible is God's written word, and most Christians do, most people who profess Christ to be their Savior, believe that the Bible is God's word written without error um, in its original manuscripts, and And so uh, the argument of evolution versus uh, create, you know, creation uh, is, is one in the very first sentence of the Bible. Because in Genesis 1, 1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. End of story. If we believe that Uh, again, this is God's word, then that is the end of the story. Abortions, and I want to reiterate on this, I don't want to sound as if I'm coming down on people that have abortions. Most women that I know that have had of them are hurting inside on it, and it's not the unforgivable sin. It is something that God can forgive just like any other sin, like my sins, like other people's sins. And if you have that and you're feeling the guilt of it and you feel as if you haven't been forgiven, I pray you would seek out a God-loving person that's full of grace that can pray with you and help you through this and, and, and let you know that God forgives you for what you've done. So please remember that. But abortions are at a rate of almost a million a year in this, hun- in this country. Uh, believe it or not, they've actually gone down in the last several years. The highest point was 1982, so we can at least be thankful for that. But the new administration that came in just signed bills back in place that allow for the, uh, the taxpayers to pay for abortions again, even if we don't want to. Uh, he also has gone, put us back into the UN Population Fund, which is where we provide money to the UN and they actually do forced abortions and they do sterilization of women from what we can see on it. They try to keep it very covered up, but people that are inside it know that's where a lot of the money is going to for that. Uh, They send the money to China and there's a couple other countries that they have the forced abortions and sterilization of women too. Um, So my question to you is, Again, if we take the Bible as God's word, and if we, if we read what the Bible says in there, we can tell right away that life begins actually before conception. And so uh, when they tell us they're not sure when, well, we can open our Bible and I can tell them when. The problem is they don't believe that the Bible is God's word. Uh, I think they believe that they may be their own God. I'm not sure, but they they don't worry about God. Um, But let me read a couple scriptures to you that actually show that. First one is from Psalm uh, 51.3. We're going to read 3 through 5. It's when David had uh, had fallen with uh, Bathsheba and with Uriah the Hittite and all the things that snowballed from the sin that he had. And he he was writing a psalm kind of confessing and and asking God to have mercy on him. In verse 3, it says, For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you prove right when you speak and justified when you judge. 
Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. So right from the very beginning when he was actually put into the womb, he says he was a sinner. You can't be a blob of cells if you uh, were a sinner. Psalm 139, we've heard this one a lot, but I think this one's even more clear. 139, 13 through 16 says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. This is not something where we have to debate when life actually begins in the womb. It's immediate. This is an area where you may not like what I'm going to say. You may not like a lot of the things I've already said. But I believe that God is going to hold us Christians more accountable because we have God's word. We're supposed to be following God's word. And a lot of that comes to the way we vote. And when we vote for people that are pro-abortion, when we vote for people that are against God's word and taking it out of schools and, and things like that, God can't look down on us and say, a boy, good job, Garrett. I'm so glad you went that way. He can't. I used to believe that if we were being an American citizen, if we were able to vote, we should just vote always. I, I'm starting to believe now that unless we're really aware of what's going on, even for our own good and our own relationship with God, maybe we shouldn't. And maybe we should do a lot more homework before we pick a candidate and, uh, and, and make sure we're voting in a way that God would want us to vote not the way we personally might think we should vote, but voting according to him. The Bible clearly tells us that we are to submit to the governing authorities. We see that in Romans. We see that in one of Peter's letters. Um, but it never wants us to go against God's word to obey the government. And there's plenty of examples of that, but I'm going to read you uh, one. Uh, one of them is from Daniel, Daniel 6.10. Now, what was going on with Daniel at the time is he was uh, one of the leaders that was brought over from, uh, from Israel into uh, Medes and Persia, and he was uh, really liked by the king, and he was high up with the king, and, and the uh, different administrators that worked with him were very jealous of him. Same reason that we see Jesus getting killed is because the leaders were jealous of him, and, and they felt as if he was taking a lot of their authority away. These people felt the same way. So this, I just wanted you to have the background so you know what's going on here. Verse 6 in chapter 6 starts, so the administrator and the satraps went as a group to the king and said, O King Darius, live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or man during the next 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, O king, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the laws of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room, where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to, to his God, just as he had done before. Daniel did not obey the government rules there because it went against what his God wanted him to do. And we 
most of us know the story of Daniel and the lion's den. I'll let you fi finish reading it when you get a moment. But um, we see that God protected him and because of his obedience to God. We want that same protection as Christians. We see many examples in the Bible. I'm not going to read them, but uh, all of them. But uh, Daniel's buddies too, Shadrach, Meshach, and again, Abednego with the furnace. Uh, Mordecai, uh, in the book of Esther, Mordecai with Haman. He was supposed to kneel down and bow to, to Haman every time he walked by. Haman was second in command to the king, and, uh, and he refused to do it. And you can see what God did in that. Uh, book too because of Mordecai's obedience. Uh, but the one, one last one I want to read to you was uh, in Acts with Peter and John. And I do want to read that one. And it comes from Acts 4. And we're going to read verses 18 through 20. And this again, getting this in context, um, uh, P uh, Peter and John um, at the time, were uh, called into the Sanhedrin, which is the Jewish leaders and, the, and again, the political leaders of the time. And they were, they were uh, being told not to preach and not to teach in the name of Jesus. And when they didn't know what to do with them, they walked out of the room, the Sanhedrin did, to discuss how they were going to handle it. And then they walked back into the room. And this is what they said. Verse 18, chapter 4 says, Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Amen to that. We're, we're going to be bullied. We're going to be, we're going to be, uh, uh, we're going to be lied to. A lot of things are going to happen to Christians, I believe, in the future. Now, I don't have the gift of prophecy, um, so I won't mislead you there. But I think from seeing what's going on, there's going to be some hard times coming up for Christians. We need to be ready for that. So what are some of the ways that we can be ready for this? What does God tell us to do? Um, we see some things that happened during Jesus' time, and we see some people that were strong when they were, when they were uh, confronted and when they were bullied, and we see some people that didn't do too well. Uh, I think of the, the blind man in John 9, and, uh, and, and he was healed by Jesus, and the Jewish leaders kept hammering him. How did this happen? Who is this? You know, how did he do this? And they went and got his parents, and they did all this stuff, and the guy just kept saying, I, I don't know. All I know, and whether he's a sinner, I don't know. I just know I was blind, and now I see. And then finally, after they keep hammering him, I love his comment. He says, well, you keep asking me that. Do you want to become his followers too? <laughs> you know that just really ticked them off. But, but he was strong, and he followed Jesus. Um, we see the same thing with leaders lying. Look how fast... Just before Christ was crucified, people came to Jerusalem during the triumphal entry. There were people just laying down the jackets, the cloaks, and the palm branches. And he was coming in on a donkey like a king, and they were worshiping him as they should do. And look how fast the leaders of, the, of Israel were able to turn the people around and turn them against Jesus. They were able to actually take the, 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 the people and get them to release Barabbas, a murderer, instead of Jesus. Because they claimed that Jesus was more of a threat than Barabbas. And so we see again that same type of thing going on here in this country. Now, I'm getting powerful close to finishing, so please bear with me. Um, one more scripture I want to do that we've all heard if we've been in the, uh, in the Christian church at all. Actually, I take that back. There's two that I do want to read that I missed here. Um, one of the things I was going to say is, so how do, we, how do we build up our strength so that we can overcome these attacks, so that we can know when we're being lied to, so we can stand up and stand firm when we're being bullied or pushed around or persecuted? There's a couple of scriptures. One of them is Hebrews. There's, there's a lot of scriptures that will actually help us with this, but this one, uh, we just happened to do it in our Bible study, and I thought this would be a great one for us to do for this. So it's uh, Hebrews 5, uh, 13. 
And, and the, the author of Hebrews is speaking to the, 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 uh, the people, and, and they're, they're believers that have been believers for a while, but they haven't grown in their faith. And unfortunately, a lot of us, I think, are that way too. We, we come to know the Lord, we, we're excited about knowing Jesus, and then we kind of just stay stagnant. And we don't move on. And a lot of that's our own fault as churches because we don't take people under our wings and start discipling them. And, and we really need to do that right now, especially now. But this is what he says to these that, that are uh, not mature in their faith. He says to them, anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness, the word. But solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. How do you train yourself? By staying with God, by being in his word, by being in prayer, by getting together with brothers and sisters in Christ and growing. That's how we train ourselves. It's not a one-time thing. We can't go to the gym, go in there, pump some iron, do an aerobics class, and then walk out and say, I'm glad that's done. I don't have to worry about that anymore. It's a constant thing. We have to keep developing those muscles and keep working on it. There's another thing that, uh, that, that was predicted by Isaiah. And he says back then, I'm going to read it to you. It's uh, Isaiah 5, verses 20 and 21. And this is what he says in there. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. One of the things we're seeing right now in this country is evil is being told as good. Abortion is a perfect example. Abortion is being taught as a good thing. It's, it's for women's health. It's for women's rights. And anyone who's against it is evil. There's endless stories and examples, I should say, of how it's getting twisted. Evil for good and good for evil. And Isaiah predicted it 700 years before Christ even came. So we have to watch for that. How do we do that? Being spiritually in shape. I want to uh, leave you with one more scripture briefly and then have an exercise for you with that piece of paper. I hope you all grab that piece of paper and something to write with um, because I'm going to be asking you to, to uh, do a little something, take a little action. But one of the things is Psalm 33.12 is very clear what it says in the beginning. It says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And so if we want to be blessed again, whether God ends up blessing this nation again or whether it goes a different direction, it's important for us as Christians to turn to him and give him 100%. And one of the scriptures we've, again, if you've been in church that we've, you've probably very familiar with, uh, but we're going to touch again because, again, I think it's so pertinent, and it's 2 Chronicles 7.14. 2 Chronicles 14 is, uh, in context, it was during when Solomon built the temple, and they were dedicating it. And so there was some things that were said during the dedication, and uh, I'm going to actually start, it's verse 14 is the one we're used to, used to, but I'm going to start from verse 11. It says, when Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord and the royal palace and had succeeded in carrying out all he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord and in his own palace, the Lord appeared to him at night and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people, if, here's that word again, if my people 
And again, it's his people. He's not asking the, those that are not part of him at that time. He's saying, my people, the Israelites back then. And we can look at that today as the Christians today. He's asking the Christians, if my people who are called by my name were called Christians, which is called by the name Jesus Christ, that's where it comes from. If they're called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. The cool thing here is God's asking us to do four things as Christians. And he promises to do three in return if we, if we do those four. The four things he asks is first, we have to humble ourselves. We have to realize it's not about us. It's not about what we feel. It's not about our strengths. It's not about uh, any of the actions that we can take. It's about him. We need to give that over to him and humble ourselves and realize it's not us. Then we got to pray. We need to pray to him. Not our own little prayer we want. Not praying while we're doing laundry or, you know, uh, making dinner. Wholeheartedly, we need to pray. We need to humble ourselves. We need to pray. We need to seek his face and nothing else around us. We need to seek his face and we need to turn from our wicked ways. And if we don't think we have wicked ways, I would just say maybe ask your spouse or, or a kid, or a parent, or a friend to show you some of the wicked ways you have. I'm sure they have a long list. We all have wicked ways. We all have things where we walk away from the Lord. We're to turn from those. And this is something that, again, we don't do this just once. We have to continue to do this, continue to humble ourselves, continue to pray, continue to seek his face, continue to turn from our wicked ways. But then he promises three things for us if we do that. He says, I will hear from heaven. He's going to hear us. We see in other places of the Bible where if we're not walking with the Lord, one of the letters of Peter mentions it too, our prayers are hindered. So if we're turning ourselves like this to him, he hears us. Our prayers are heard. Then he says he forgives the sins. What an awesome thing to happen. What a way of pulling that sin and that weight off from us. Again, going back to things like abortion and addictions and different things like that, he can forgive that. But then he says he'll heal the land. He will heal the land that we're, that we're in and that we're living in. So I'm going to ask you to grab that piece of paper and that pencil. And I'm going to first tell you I've already done this myself because God laid this sermon on my heart for me to share. He definitely wanted me to share it. But he also is saying, Garrett, you got areas in your life where you're not 100% with me. And you need to start working on them. And I guarantee as I work on them, he's going to give me more. And that's okay. We're not to be in a comfort zone right now. We're to be ready to go out there and take action and get closer to God and be ready for whatever it is that he knows is coming. So take that piece of paper. I want you to take a minute. I want you to write down the first thing God is laying on your heart. Don't put a million things because you'll never do it. Do one, maybe two on there and start with that. Take that piece of paper. Do not lose that piece of paper and do not just throw it in the corner. If God's laying it on your heart, he wants you to do it. And again, if you feel like there's, you know, you know I can't think of anything that I need to improve on... If Mother Teresa and Billy Graham were still alive today, and if I went up and asked them the same question, I guarantee they would just keep writing. They'd have a list so long, I'd have to finally stop them. And I can promise you there's very few of us who are as godly as Mother Teresa and Billy Graham are. So there's definitely some things that we can work on. This is not a, 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 a punishment type thing. This is not a, you're a bad person. This is something that should be a conviction to help us grow closer to the one who loves us, us, who is teaching us how to love others and to love him too. We should want to do this. So I, I pray that you would do it. Again, don't not do it, do it. Um, and, then, and then write it down. Put down the pride, lift up the pencil, and, and, and do this. Um, I'm going to close us in a word of prayer, but again, I'm going to ask you, please don't neglect this. 
Take your one or two things that God is laying on your heart, write them down, and start taking action on them now so that we can get right with the Heavenly Father who loves us. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time. I thank you, Lord, for who you are. I thank you for what you are. I thank you for your grace, your mercy, and, uh, and just your forgiveness for your son who died for us even when we don't deserve it. But Lord, I also thank you that you show us what's right and what's wrong, and you help us to get, to get it right. And when we get it wrong, you're there to forgive us, but you're also there to help us to get back on track. And we thank you for that. Lord, be with us. Be with this nation that you so wonderfully blessed. And Lord, may we be in line with you. We love you, Lord. And we lift this all up in Jesus' name. Amen.